Oh, praise the Lord. Wasn't that beautiful? It's wonderful to see kids, praise the Lord. And you know, there's just not enough of that going around today. In the day and age we're living in, there's so many trials and tribulations and so many problems. It just seems like they, it can't get any worse. But is it going to? Oh, you better believe it is. And that's why I've chosen this topic today, enduring to the end. Okay? It's so easy to say, hey, if it's too much, I'm just going to give up. But that's not what we're called to do. You know, Jesus said that he that endures to the end, the same will be saved. And I think all of us here today want to be saved. And that's why we're here. Okay? So we're going to examine some things. And uh, before I get into that, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of you have probably heard that, that familiar saying that says, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again, you know. And some of the things we enjoy, for instance, the light bulb, if the person that invented that hadn't tried and tried again, we may not have light bulbs today. Okay. You understand he tried many hundreds of times before he finally succeeded in getting a light bulb to work properly. So it's important that we don't give up, okay? And Pastor Jim Gilly would say, keep on keeping on, right? And so in Spanish we say, para adelante, para arriba, forward and upward, okay? No going back, no backward steps. Today we are called to go forward and upward. With our eye on who? On Jesus. That is correct. Psalms 91 has some marvelous promises. But as all promises, even the promises of Psalm 91 has some conditions. Okay? And the conditions we find right in the beginning. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So, <laughs> if I say I live in Cleburne, is that true? I come here often. No, I live in Alvarado. Okay, I live in Alvarado. I don't live in Cleburne. I come often. Actually, I make two trips a day. And on Sabbath, I'm here. You know, so... I'm here often, but I don't live in Cleburne. I live, I dwell in Alvarado, where I spend the most of my time. That's where I live or dwell. Okay? So, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's where we spend the most of our time. And we should spend the most of our time at the feet of Jesus. And then we'll be able to t make ours those promises that are found throughout. We will be protected under his wings and covered with his feathers. We won't have to fear the snare of the fowler and the pestilence that's going around Ebola. <laughs> you know, we won't have to fear those things when we learn to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? And we'll see the thousand falling at our side and ten thousand at our right hand. But it will not come nigh us. Only with our eyes shall we behold and see the reward of the wicked. And he'll send his angels and they'll lift us up so our foot won't stumble on a rock. We'll be able to tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the dragon will trample under feet. But that's only when we abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Okay? So, the only way we can claim these promises and make them ours is as we abide, as we fulfill the conditions to receive that promise. Okay? Jesus used a really interesting illustration that um, I want to comment and when we talk about abiding, we're talking about something that is enduring or permanent, that has an unbreakable connection. That's really what abiding 
is all about. And in John chapter 15, 1 through 16, we'll find a real interesting illustration. Jesus says, I'm the vine. My father's the husband then. And the branches that don't bear fruit, my father cuts them away. But the ones that bear fruit, he prunes so that they'll bring more fruit. They'll give more fruit. Okay? So, again he repeats, I am the vine. Abide in me. And as we go through that story, eight times the word abide is used. So I think Christ is trying to get a a message across to us that is really, really important. Abiding in Him. And it's not something that we do just once a week or ten minutes a day. It's something that's an ongoing thing. Okay? Now, I don't know how many of you are aware that the grapes that we eat today are all the result of a graft. Okay? And the apples and the peaches and the plums and the pecans and so many other things that we enjoy are the result of grafting. Okay? Even the roses that we enjoy are the result of grafting. Because the wild rose has five single petals. Just a simple little flower. They do smell good. Okay? But in order to get a beautiful rose like this, they've grafted and grafted and grafted to make a better quality rose. Okay? Anybody here ever done any grafting? Here's a fellow that's done some grafting. All right. So he's going to be able to sympathize and understand what I'm talking about. But I want to describe to you just briefly what grafting is all about. Generally, and I'm going to speak specifically of the pecan nut, all right? What they do is they collect nuts from a wild pecan tree and they plant them. And up comes the tree. And they let it grow to maybe this high so that the trunk is an inch or so in diameter, sometimes a little larger. Actually, you can graft into any size. You can even graft into a stump that this, that's this big if you want to. But they generally do it when the tree is tender. And what they do is they cut it off just about that far above the ground. But then, before doing that, they've actually cut some saplings, some little twigs off a tree that gives larger nuts. Okay? Once they've cut that off, they take and cut the bark down about that far and peel it back so that it's down to the wood part. The bark has two layers, the outer bark and the inner bark. They actually have to cut through the inner bark and peel that back. And then that twig, they have to make sure there's a place where a branch will grow out of the twig. And they take a very sharp knife and cut it. And they cut it away till they've cut it to the heart. They cut it all the way to the center of that little twig. Only halfway. They leave the other half complete. All right? So once they've cut it all the way to the heart, they stick it down in between the bark and up against that wood. That open part where they've cut to the heart, they put that right down in against the wood. And they close the bark around it as best they can. Then they take some nylon string and they start going round and round. They start right at the top and go round and round and round and round and work their way down just a a string uh, width at a time until they get all the way down to the bottom of where they had slit the bark. Okay? Once that's done, they melt some wax and pour the wax on top and around to seal it. So no water, no germs or bacteria, nothing can get in it that could cause a separation of that twig from the trunk. All right? As it's been bound together like that, it begins to take life from the roots. And that little tiny twig will begin to grow and make a brand new tree. And it'll be a better tree than the one it was before because it'll give nice big nuts instead of the small wild nuts that would have been of the natural tree. Isn't that interesting? Now, like I said, this is done to so many of the foods that we eat today. 
It's really amazing. But I'd like to illustrate this using that example of how we need to be grafted into Jesus Christ. Jesus came to this earth and he began to grow. At a young age, they cut him off. His skin was open. Each one of us have to be cut to the heart to get rid of self, to get rid of our ambitions, our pride. And then, where we've been opened up, we have to be stuck in to Christ Jesus. And then, with the cords of his love, we have to be bound. We have to be bound, tied tight, so there's no separation. And after we've been bound all the way down to where that wound ended, then the Holy Spirit has to be poured on top of us. We have to be drenched with the Holy Spirit. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It has to cover in such a way that nothing can get in to separate us from Christ. Then, and only then, can we begin to grow and bring forth fruit for the honor and glory of God's kingdom. So, praise the Lord for these simple illustrations in nature. And Jesus used that illustration when he talked about the vine and the branches. And even then, when we do bring forth fruit, sometimes we're pruned. And pruning isn't always gentle. Has anyone here ever watched anybody prune a tree? (laughs) They cut and they clip and they chop and they do different things to that tree to get rid of anything that won't bring forth fruit. And so that gives more sap, more vitality to the branches that will bring forth fruit so that they can blossom and bring forth the fruit that we need. And sometimes even after that, sometimes we pull away some of the fruit, some of the smaller fruit, so the bigger, better looking fruit will be able to get more vitality and grow even better yet. Okay? Well... In nature, the same, I mean, in, in spiritual life, the same thing happens. It applies also. And sometimes it's not pleasant. Now, it's really interesting because Paul used that same story only with an olive tree in Romans uh, chapter 11. And he compared the Jews to being the natural branches, but they were cut away because they rejected Christ as the Savior. And the Gentiles were grafted in, in their place. Isn't that something? So, in like manner, each one of us, even though we may not be Jews, we are of the main stock because we've been grafted in as we've accepted Christ Jesus as our personal Savior. Well, that pruning... Oh, I need to tell you this. This this is a statement from a Bible commentary, volume 4, page 1161. And it's talking about the sealing. And it says, as soon as we are sealed, something's going to happen. But before it tells what, it says, the sealing is a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so that we cannot be moved. Okay? So here again, we're seeing the importance of that union, that we can't be separated. All right? Going back to the graft, if I graft the branch in and do all that work to get it in, but the next day I yank it out, and then the next day I try to poke it back in again and pour some more wax on it, is it going to heal and and begin to grow? But then a few days later, if I pull it out again, no. So we need something, a connection, that nothing or nobody can move us. Okay? Okay? And that's what this union with Christ is all about. Now, sometimes the pruning isn't a pleasant thing. Oh, and it says right after we've been sealed and settled into the truth, then the shaking will come. (laughs) Okay, that's interesting. And it's my prayer that each one of us can be settled into the truth or mature in Christ Jesus to the fact and to the point where nothing will move us. And it doesn't matter what goes on around us or what we see on the news. Okay? And, and brothers and sisters, it's coming here quickly. It might be happening up in St. Louis or 
Ferguson or whatever the name of that place is up there. It may be happening there now, but it's going to be happening here too. And, you know, we hear about stuff that happens in Mexico. We hear about stuff that happens in Venezuela. We hear about stuff that's happening in Israel. And we don't seem to be affected by it, but that can happen here any day. You see? So we have to be settled into the truth in such a way that we will not be moved. As a matter of fact, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, give us a really interesting insight. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Wow. (laughs) Do we call it joy when we have trials and tribulations, when things go all wrong? It says, knowing this, verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Interesting, huh? We generally don't think about trials as being something to be happy about. (laughs) But... The interesting thing is that these trials be for our faith. Okay? Because sooner or later we will be tried for our faith. You know, um, 1 Peter 4 gives us an insight on something like that as well. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting with verse 1. It says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, that for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased to, from sin. That's pretty powerful. And then it goes on. For he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to, lust, to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. And it goes on talking about when we were Gentiles, we acted like them. But now that we belong to Christ, they are surprised to see that we don't run with them and do the same things we used to do with them. And they revile us, it says. They make fun of us because we don't do it anymore. But let's jump down to verse 12. It says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which if, uh, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now again, as we learn to cope with trials and tribulations and things that don't go right in our daily living, we will learn how to cope with when they begin to revile us and even take us to court because of our faith or maybe fire us from our job because of our faith or kick us out of school or university because of our faith, okay? then we can call it all joy because we are suffering the sufferings of Christ. Okay? Now, if we're suffering because we've robbed or because we've lied or because we've done something wrong, <laughs> there's no virtue in that. <laughs> okay? But when we've done what's right, when we're standing up for the true principles of the Word of God and yet we are reviled and persecuted, we should rejoice. Because we are able to partake in the sufferings of Christ. And when he is revealed in his glory, we will be with him. Okay? So, I thought that was a really important point. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Even though we may suffer in this world, notice what it says here. Romans chapter 8, 16 through 18. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory 
which, is, which shall be revealed in us. Okay? This is talking now about when Jesus comes and our bodies are transformed into immortal bodies, incorruptible bodies. <laughs> Whatever we've suffered in this life isn't even going to be remembered. Okay? It's not worth even to be mentioned in comparison to the glory that we will have and we will see in Christ Jesus then. So, let's remember that. And also Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 gives us another little insight on that same thought. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18. And he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Okay? So I thought it was interesting how he calls it our light affliction. Only as a moment. You know, even though we live 90 years on this old earth, what is that in comparison to eternity? You know, even though we may have suffered all those 90 years, if we compare that to eternity in glory with no pain, with no crying or death, with no sin, won't that be glorious? So, there's, nothing, there's no way we can compare it at all. And 1 Peter 5, Peter gives us some more insight on this. First Peter chapter 5. Now I always like to start with verse 7. It says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. So even while we're in the trial and tribulation on this earth, if we can learn to take all those trials and tribulations to him, he cares for us. So why should we worry? Okay? But then it goes on, verse 8 says, Be sober and vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion... Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And a lot of times we stop there. But we shouldn't stop. It doesn't stop there. It goes on sa saying, Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in, all, in your brethren that are in the world. In other words, everybody suffers. You know, the suffering we may have isn't peculiar only to, to us. There's other people that are suffering just as bad, maybe even worse. Okay? I don't know how many of you heard the story of the man that complained because he had no shoes until he saw a man that had no feet. You know? So sometimes we complain about things that are so trivial. And you know, this was the major sin of the children of Israel. Whenever they came into some kind of a trial or tribulation on their travels through the desert, they immediately began to complain against Moses and against Aaron and against God. They began to murmur and complain. And some of them would stand in the tent of their, the door of their tent and murmur and complain. Okay? And that spreads like wildfire. You know that? And it's hard to put it out. <laughs> so... <laughs> Instead of grumbling and complaining, we should understand that there's others that are in worse conditions than we are. And the best remedy for depression is to seek somebody that's in a worse condition than us and try to help them. And you'd be surprised that depression will disappear very rapidly when we do that. But let's go on. Um, verse 10. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a little while. There it is again, just a little while. Even the suffering of all our life on this earth is nothing in comparison. It's just compared to as a little while. What will happen? He will make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So there it goes back to that verse, being settled into the truth so we can be sealed. Okay? So I love it. The Word of God is so beautiful. Our scripture reading in Matthew twenty four thirteen says that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. 
Well, let's, let's look at Matthew 10. It says something similar. And I'm going to start with verse 16. Matthew 10:16 says, "Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in the synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And a brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father a child, and the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Well, that's, that's heavy, huh? We don't like to be hated. We like to be liked and accepted. But if we stand for truth in this time that we're living in, there will come a time when we will be hated by all men because of the truth. And it ends by saying, but he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So there's that same promise. Okay? And in order to have that promise, we need to fulfill the condition. Okay? Of enduring to the end. Romans 8, 28 tells us, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. And I like to say to them who, are, who respond to the call according to His purpose. Because we've all been called, yes or no? Yeah, we've all been called, but whether we respond or not, that's, that's, that's the dividing point right there, right? You know, there's special promises to those who endure to the end. And sometimes we don't uh, take into account these promises. And these promises are also given for the overcomers, okay? And I'll give you the text, you can read them later. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, verse 11, verse 17, and verse 26. And then in chapter 3, verse 5, verse 12, and verse 21. There's some really interesting promises there. I'd like to just share them with you real quickly. It says, To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life. How many of us want to eat of the tree of life? <laughs> I definitely do. I'm looking forward to eating of each one and tasting each one of the different fruits that it gives each month. You know, that's going to be amazing. And I'm sure we'll be delighted with each different flavor. <laughs> but that promises to him that overcometh. Right? Right? And, you know, we can start eating the, the leaves of the tree of life right now. We may not be able to eat the fruit, but we can eat the leaves of the tree of life right now as we study the Holy Bible. Here, these, each page of the Bible is, as it were, a leaf off the tree of life. And as we study our Bible, we're told in Revelation 22.2 uh, that the leaves are for the healing of the nations. So if we want health and healing, here it is. Okay? We have it in our hands, and we need to make it ours. The second verse that I mentioned says that to him that overcometh, he shall not be hurt of the second death. You know, that's amazing. Jesus took that second death so that we don't have to experiment it, experience it. Isn't that amazing? So praise the Lord. As we accept Jesus as standing before his Father in our behalf, as our high priest, as our advocate, as our lawyer, and as our judge. You know, that's, it's amazing. We don't have to fear the second death. Okay? The third one says, I will give him to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone and a new name. Isn't that interesting? Those are some promises that are pretty neat. I don't know how many of you are, are rock hounds. 
I'm a rack hound. I love collecting stones. I have loads of stones. Okay? And um, they're beautiful. You know, God has put in nature some absolutely gorgeous things. But I can hardly imagine that stone that Jesus is going to give to me and to each one of you. Okay? The fourth one says, I will give him power over nations and the morning star. That's going to be amazing, huh? (laughs) And as a matter of fact, during the millennium, each one of us will sit as judges over those who are not in heaven. Okay? So yes, we will rule over nations. And who knows, later on, God may make us ruler over certain different worlds. We don't know what eternity will bring. It's beyond us to know. But it says here, he'll make us rule over nations. Number five says, To him that overcometh, he shall be clothed with white raiment. Now it's interesting because we need to be clothed with that white raiment here, don't we? Okay? And we know that that white raiment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And then it goes on to say that same promise, And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and the angels. Isn't that amazing? So again, we see Jesus standing as our representative before the heavenly beings. And then the next one says, To him that overcometh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and I will write on him God's name and the name of his city, the New Jerusalem, and his new name. So each of us are going to have new names. And we'll have it written on us. You know, I've been to some churches where as you come in the door, they greet you and ask you your name, and then they take you to a little machine and they type in your name and print out a tag and you stick it on your jacket or on your blouse so that people, when they come up to greet you, they can take your hand and say your name. Okay? And that's pretty neat. So when we get to heaven, we're all going to have new names. And it's going to be written on us. So others, when they greet us, they'll know our name. (laughs) We'll have to ask each other our names. The final one is that he will grant us to sit in in his throne, even as he is overcome and is set down with his father. In his throne. That's pretty awesome. You know, sometimes here on this earth, we may dream of becoming president or being able to sit in a throne or in a a place of authority. But we're promised that if we overcome, we will sit in a throne. And that's amazing. I can't wait to experience that. And so, as we come to the close, there's a couple of more texts that I want to look at. One of them is... 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. And I want to encourage each of us that today, as we go through the final time on this earth, the time of trouble and tribulation that we know is to come on this earth, that like Paul, we can say, and this is, um, what did I say? 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Okay? So I encourage you, brothers and sisters, let's fight that good fight of faith and go forward. Enduring to the end, so that we can inherit eternal life. And there's a really interesting blessing that a lot of us, you know, when we think about blessings, the Beatitudes, we think always of Matthew 5, but there's a really interesting Beatitude here in James chapter 1 and verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So once again, brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. Yes, there may be troublesome times before us, but we need to remember, Jesus has already walked the path before us. He's already endured it for us. And the way he endured it was by saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. But if it cannot be, let thy will be done and not mine. 
So may this be the prayer of each one of us as day by day we go forward with our eyes fixed on Jesus marching toward the kingdom of heaven. May God bless you. Will you stand with me in closing? 602. 602.